If we can uh, hold your attention for a minute, Jimmy's broken a string, a guitar string, and before we go on, we have to fix the guitar string. We're going to feature tonight a couple of numbers from the album Led Zeppelin on the Atlantic label. I don't know whether you've heard it. And we hope to carry on with a thing from uh, Otis Rush. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. My name is Mark McFall. This is episode 18 of the Zepp Fan All Things Led Zeppelin podcast. I feel like diving right into it today. So real quick, if you need to reach out to me, contact at zepfan.com. That's it. Let's go. Hit it. Director Peter Michael Dowd felt the story of Akio Sakurai had to be told. Sakurai's story is dedicated to honoring Jimmy Page. For 30 years, he recreated Led Zeppelin concerts note for note in small Tokyo clubs until the day the real Jimmy Page stopped by one night and his life changed forever. Inspired by Mr. Page's ovation, he quits his day job, leaving behind his family to move to Los Angeles and join the tribute band Led Zepp again. Soon, cultures clashed in the band and Sakurai's serene vision of America is quickly met with reality. That is until Jason Bonham calls and invites him to join the band, the Led Zeppelin Evening Tour. With that captivating story, Peter Michael Dowd took on the role as director, producer, and editor and set out to make this documentary, Mr. Jimmy. Peter is joining us today to discuss this unique film. Peter, it's an honor. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? I'm good, man. The honor is mine. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, very cool. I'm excited to talk about this movie. Um, and I've noticed you've, you're you getting a lot of great press. That must be really exciting as well. That's always a plus when you put out a movie, I imagine. It is. I mean, um, eight year, especially eight years in on this, this one is a real labor of love. So it's not, um, it's my first feature. I hope they all don't take eight years, but, um, <laughs> you know, if they do, they do, I guess. But eight years is... Uh, uh, it, this one is, a, like I said, a true labor of love and to finally have it out and, and people uh, seem to be uh, really into it and excited to see it in, in theaters, especially. Uh, right. It's really cool. Yeah, I, lo I watched a lot of this unfold through social media because I've always kind of followed Led Zepp again and just, you know, always pops up on the feed. And of course, I love Mr. Jimmy. I don't play any instruments, but I think he's spot on when you see someone um play like that it just it blows me away i know i've heard all the bootlegs and just the way he does note for note and to actually see the story from social media and then i'm watching the movie the other night and i'm like oh wow yeah i remember all this i remember all this and they're talking about the drummer and all that stuff it's like it kind of, it's kind of cool because you finally hear the backstory of it yeah i found the story very fascinating as i mentioned so while there are tons of tribute bands out there you know most of them do not warrant a documentary right but someone like Akio Sakurai takes it to the next level. And when I say next level, I, we're not talking one level. We're talking level, level, level. So anyone who sees this movie is going to be like, okay, I get it. So talk a little bit. Of, I mean, one could convince you that this is a story that needed to be told. I mean, how did this all originate eight years ago? Yeah, so it really, uh, it's funny. Uh, I, I can picture it. It was one night. Um, I got a text from a pal saying, hey, Hey, Peter, uh, he knew I was a big Zeppelin fan. He said, hey, Peter, I just saw a Led Zeppelin tribute band in Boston that that wasn't total shit. I think that's what he said verbatim. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't even uh, a Kiyo Sakurai, but it was just, a, 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 he said it was a pretty good tribute band. And it got my mind going about, huh, what is a tribute band? What right. is this thing? And, you know, it's kind of like one thing to try to do a painting like Van Gogh, but then what if you also dress like Van Gogh? What if you also cut your ear off? What if you uh, try to live like them? I thought that's kind of interesting. And uh, so I started looking at all these tribute bands on YouTube. I went down a real uh, rabbit hole there right. and I was pretty amused. I mean, every band out there has somebody trying to be them and I can't imagine what it's like for the artists. Um, but after a while, I, I ultimately I thought it's not in me to make a movie where I'm just taking a piss out of somebody. So right. most of the bands I saw, God bless them, um, they just weren't that good. So I just thought, yeah, maybe this is a bad idea. I, I don't want to make a film if it's tongue in cheek, poking fun at somebody, um, if it's really not a top level appreciation of their talent. And then all of a sudden I saw this clip. I think it was just labeled Rain Song 1979 version. Click on it. 
And I mean, instantly I recognized, wait a minute, he's got the blue button down shirt. He's yeah. got the white button pants. He's got the black loafers. He tracked down every garment of Paige's August 79 outfit. And you know, I mean, Nebworth is, you've got to be a little deep as a fan to right. know Nebworth, appreciate Nebworth, and know the costume head to toe. Because I'm thinking every, there's so many guys out there with a, a bad rendition of a dragon suit. Right. But this, this was spot on uh, tailored clothes for Nebworth look. And then I'm like, this is wild. But more importantly, I, I turn my ears on and listen, and yeah. he is so bang on in the 79 arrangement and tone of the rain song that I started to get chills. And then the way he was moving, holding his body, and then he's playing something with the Les Paul with the, the yellow strap that Paige had at, at Nebworth. And I'm like, all these details. And then I click on something from 1970. He's got a fake beard. I'll right. In 1970. 77, he's got the white dragon suit. 75, Earl's Court, he's got the black dragon suit. All the outfits, plus the most important thing is the music. He was playing it so spot on, the live arrangements uh, with incredible fidelity. And then the, the performance. I was like, this guy's a virtuoso musician himself. Right. He's a musical historian, the way he's approaching it. And he's like a method actor. I mean, I just thought... This is wild. And I, I I almost just reacted emotionally, like, I love this. Right. I don't know. I don't know what this is all about. It's a little bit mad, but it's also awesome. I totally right. love it. And I just didn't even think. I just found his website, which was totally in Japanese. And I just sent a message saying, Really don't know exactly what your story is, but I think it might be a very interesting one. And I might be a good person to tell it because I'm really rec I recognize all these details as a fan. And um his wife wrote back and said, you're a lucky guy because he's just moved to L.A. to join Zepp again. Oh, right. So at that point, I, I thought, oh, this is like uh, a sign. Right, to be told, yeah. Uh, but then st even saying that, I still thought, well, maybe it would be uh, how how deep can we go with this? Would it be a short or a feature? So I, I said, let me film one show and interview him and go from there. And I said, Come in, uh, bring a guitar, play your favorite Zeppelin song. And he brings in his guitar. He plays the Rain song. I'm getting chills because it feels like I'm inside the record. It was yeah. wild. And he finishes, and I'm like, oh, my God, that was so beautiful. And I just say, well, how long did it take you to figure out that song? It's an uh, innovative tuning. It's very tricky. Yeah. To a lot of people can str struggle figuring out how to play it. And uh, he looks at me and goes, about oh, 35 years. And I'm like, still working on it right I'm like that's crazy and then he's like what are you laughing for and i was like whoa and he's like i still listen to the recording and maybe one adjustment a year i might adjust one finger position a year or one note a year and i'm still fine-tuning it after 35 years of study and i was like oh this might be a feature so um that was the moment when i was like this is really deep and, and then once i went to japan and saw his work on the pickups, uh, on the amplifiers with Mr. Suzuki, uh, figuring out how much solder to put on a capacitor to get, you know, the 73 tone. I was just like, this is just uh, beyond. This is really, if I wanted to treat it with, to show how much work he put in. I was like, I would like to spend the time of a feature because it also is highly reflective of well, how much time and how much evolution went into Mr. Page's sound? So um, right. it's not just pick up a guitar and, and play the notes. Um, you know, it's really finding your tone, developing your tone, you know, uh, and, and digging into, of course, what Akio has done over now 35, 40 years of work on this thing. So, yeah, that's when I knew, OK, this is kind of going to be a deep ride. When I saw got the documentary and that's when I first heard about it, that's what I'm thinking too. Cause yeah, it is a tribute band. I know how great he is and how, what direction are you going to take it? And you mentioned the capacitors and I, I remember watching the film and within about 10, 15 minutes in, you're like, Oh, I get it now. Cause he, I mean, he's talking about these 1950 capacitors and soldering them. It's like, it, it's just mind blowing how much detail that goes into it. And to actually play every you know play this year and that year and you know yeah. to know every arrangement it just to, it's uh, like you said he's an artist an actor he's just everything rolled up into one 
So what I mean, what is your Zeppelin background? Because I think to really respect what he does, you do need to know Led Zeppelin. You need to know the bootlegs. I mean, so what's your story in Led Zeppelin and what got you started into the band? Yeah, yeah I'm a, I'm a maniac. Um, I don't know. I probably have 300-ish bootlegs uh, in my collection. Um, yeah, I fell in love with Zeppelin. I think I, w- I was a freshman in high school. A senior used to drive me to to high school, and he would usually play some pretty, uh, no offense if you like winger, but pretty shitty music, (laughs) winger and whatever else was early 90s stuff. And I would kind of tune it out. And then one day, I remember he grabbed this white cassette, put it in, and the riff to Whole Lot of Love started. And I mean, it was as seminal a fucking memory as my first sexual experience. I I was just like, the riff just took over my brain and i was just like what is this this is like fucking some beethoven shit and it was just like yo what's happening right now and then once the drums come in and then plants vocals over the top i'm like whoa and then uh, so i'm vibing on this riff i'm vibing on this riff and um it was like the most conscious i've ever been of the construction of a song i remember as soon as they go into the bridge i was thinking like oh Oh my God. I remember I had this thought clear as day. I said, Oh my God, this band created the most perfect riff in the history of rock and roll. They created this thing, and any other band would cling to this riff and then never let it go. A thousand times over. Yep. And in the bridge, they take this riff and like throw it away. And all of a sudden, you've got Tabla going, a fucking theremin, Robert Plant's having an orgasm. Like, right what and i was like this is it this is like experiment some experimental shit all of a sudden and then bonham comes back in with the drums insane page solo back to the riff orgasmic experience so i'm thinking whoa and i asked what the hell is this oh this is zeppelin (laughs) Zeppelin 2 i'm like i need like all of this i need all this stuff and then one by one i mean what's awesome about back in the day you know you had to save up to buy the record you had to save up to do one by one by one what record should i get next and eventually i got into song remains the same the movie the soundtrack and at first i was like this might be too deep for me what's going on (laughs) this is like so far beyond the studio records but then i really got into it and then yeah growing up in boston i remember i would go down to harvard square and there was a record shop there. It wasn't in your ear. It's another record. I can't. Remember. I was trying to think of the name of the record shop. I can't remember. But they would have bootlegs, and they would be I don't know what the, 30, 40, 50 bucks. Yeah. So I couldn't. I couldn't afford to. I would like a b them. I would drive them insane because I'd be like, oh, can I listen to that? Listen to the Zeddy again, and I really want to compare that to like Blueberry Hill, and I don't know, man. And I would like for weeks. <laughs> For weeks until I finally had 40 bucks and would be like, all right, man, I'm going to go for Destroyer or whatever it was. Like, I, you know, and then or my buddy, we would team up. I'll get New Orleans 73. You get Destroyer. We'll make tapes for each other. Trade. Hey, yep. Um, and then just one by one, you know, started building up the live stuff. And um, and then when I was, when was this? Uh, going into college, Page Plant reunited around that time. And I remember I saw Page Plant at Boston Garden, one of the last shows ever at Boston Garden. My buddy and I, we were first in line at uh, Tower Records on Newbury Street, got interviewed by WBCN. I think we were first in line by a margin of like five hours because we didn't realize that <laughs> the first like hundred people that line up, they were going to do this stupid thing with wristbands and random numbers. And yeah. it was a waste of time to get there like 10 hours early than anyone else. But we didn't give a fuck. We were really proud that we were first in line. Right. Dedication. You know? Yeah. And when when Paige came out on stage at Boston Garden and I think it was 95, yep. like um I remember I could just see like his cigarette in the dark. And I mean I I lost my shit. Give me, man. I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. at that point I had never seen him yeah. live stage. So I flipped out. And anyway, and then 98, 98 tour was insane for me because by then i mean page's chops were so fierce the no quarter solo live in 98 how many more times live in 98 i mean that stuff was insane mind-boggling so um anyway i've got a pretty deep collection of of bootlegs and other stuff and have a real passion for it and i just thought when i when mr jimmy came along when akio came along i was like wow this is like if i if i could have been around in 73 or something and making a documentary 
on page and on Zeppelin on tour, like it's a little bit of a fantasy camp experience of that, of, well, right. at least I can film this Japanese guy digging <laughs> into it. And, uh, but anyway, yeah, I'm not a poser. Like I'm not like some guy who, uh, uh, like really dig stairway or something like that. Right. And like, yeah, I'll just make this Zeppelin movie. Like I- I'm a complete maniac as well. Right. And to see, to appreciate Mr. Jimmy, you have to understand those bootlegs too, because he could definitely replicate, the album's no problem, but just the yeah. way he does, I mean, the whiskey a go-go shows he does from that yeah. 69 sound. He's just so dialed into it. I think, I think what's cool about that though, is like, um, you know, it again, always brings you back to the original and it makes you really appreciate like, wow, Jimmy Page was like just constantly pushing it, you know, yeah. constantly pushing his tone, trying something new. The whole band was pushing it. I mean, a 75 show versus a 69 show. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. Totally different vibes. Um, uh, the the gear, the 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 stage presence, the everything. I mean, um, a wild evolution and this really bold commitment to change and right. to just push it. And uh, that's, I think, what's been awesome about it too is like digging into what was how awesome page's sound was in 69 and then you know his sound on a high watt versus a marshall and and this evolution and and then of course just the general beauty of the live improvisation like yeah who else has the balls to go out there and true like really improvise like yeah. really, really go off a cliff like it's pretty great but led zeppelin albums are the same thing right everyone has different texture i mean the, for me as a fan de- dedicated fan to led zeppelin when i listen to any album house of the holy or physical you know you, my mind thought is more of what would they were doing at the time too because just like their live material the albums have that same t- texture they're all different yeah. you know you can see how they're just exploring it and pushing it and they just move onwards working with a q what were some of your takeaways after you met him and just seeing him play? What's some of the stuff that really blew you away about him? I mean, I guess I, I just, at first, um, I always thought, I mean, you know, uh, all right, he's done this a lot and for a lot of years. So am I going to ever catch him playing Stairway to Heaven half ass <laughs> or going through the motions? But that guy, it is like, uh, Every time he's up on stage, it's Christmas morning or something oh. like that. Like he, 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 his love for it is so pure and it's inspiring to me as an artist because it's just like he's holding on to that magical inspiration of whenever you were 14 or 15 and you got the song remains the same on for the first time and you're playing air guitar to the no quarter, uh, live, you know, jam. And he is still in that state of rapture and exploration right. and, um, it's awesome and he just um he's just so uh committed to just trying to 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 do things uh correctly and to really right. pay homage properly to this music that really is the classical music of our time and uh you know it was inspiring to me and our small crew we always we kind of after our first day or two of filming with Akio, we were like you know we have to meet his level right. we have to whatever it takes we have to multi-track these shows we have to film this uh, right. as artfully as we can we have to do we have to do right by him as he's doing right by jimmy page we have to always do right by the music and uh it really was inspiring to keep our level high and um yeah it was it was incredible to see his, his work ethic and his, his mind working on, on the g- details always it's not just the playing it like we talked about earlier it's the um costumes too they're so detailed and then he's even detailed the light structure too and i think when he does the network show he has that special lighting on the side or something it just looks fantastic and you see these pictures and a lot of them are the publicity shots you have and you know just the lighting and the, ca- the way they capture them it, it's really just blows you away on, on how accurate it really is yeah we just did um so uh you know for this edition of the film you know for our 2023 release we just went through and did one more pass on sound mix and one more pass on color correction. And I was looking at the stuff on stage of that theater uh, in Tokyo. And I was like, it's, it is the, just the fact that they brought in all those hot lights uh, is such a, it, that's the vibe. You you can't do that shit with these modern led. Right. It's an like, 
it just ca- it captured it. and they had the original pyro cues at that show which is like <laughs> wild and yeah i remember seeing that uh, yeah. <laughs> all that stuff but yeah i mean and it goes to show you that i think wh- part of uh jimmy page's genius uh is on stage and the concept of the stage show and i mean the thing is uh also thinking back to Nowadays, you go to a show and the video screens are, I don't even know, like at SoFi or like yeah. the size of a football field or something. Back then, like, how? okay, so you have uh, 40,000 people at Tampa and you have no video screen. So you have to, to, you have to make your show somehow visually <laughs> compelling. Um, how do you do that? And uh, even beyond that, I just think Part, certainly part of uh, Zeppelin's power is their iconic power, the iconography of, of Jimmy Page. And I think that's why, like, his book of uh, his sort of uh, photographic autobiography is so cool because it's like all it's it's intertwined. The, the music, the stage performance, the presence, the look, the costume. It was, in essence, a, a, a character on stage. Yeah, always telling a story. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, I, I don't know, what's uh, um, like uh, the wing song, Paul McCartney has those lines about like uh, Jimmy Page looks like a relic from a different age. Oh. <laughs> because um, it just, it's it's just part of the the, the magic. It's just right. something different. And certainly, I mean, doing theremin and, and stuff like that, there's something remarkable. Not everybody could pull that off, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, Jimmy just looks so cool doing it. And I think you are you are conjuring something, there. right? And I think that's really uh, again, and, and the look, you know, that's why I do think ninety nine percent of these uh, cover bands or whatever they are, it's uh, uh, it's not up to snuff because right. um, to it, the the real thing is is pretty magical and. Yeah. and it's all it's all connected um the look your stage presence obviously number one is the music and the playing all that stuff has to be world class otherwise you're you're not going to be close to the level so well speaking of the music and doing this documentary obviously the biggest or the most important thing would be having the rights to play led zeppelin in your movie is there something involved in doing that can you just put out a movie and have him play uh zeppelin or yeah there's a lot of oh. stuff you have to go through right what is that process yeah. like and well what, I, guess, I guess when i started in a way i was fortunate that i was a blissful uh idiot to all things legal and all that stuff <laughs> sometimes it helps <laughs> yeah because I, I was just like this naive uh do-gooder or something or schmuck or something but i just thought i don't know i'm just going to act in good faith and hopefully this will work out but no we we i waited uh with bated breath before our South by Southwest premiere to hear either thumbs up or thumbs down. And a thumbs down would have been quite sad because it would have meant that the movie was on my shelf and maybe I show it to my grandmother every Christmas or something like (laughs) that. That's it. No, I mean, that, that's the the biggest, to me, that's um, a, something that I'm eternally grateful to the artists for, to Jimmy plant, John Paul Jones, the estate of John Bonham. For somehow uh, having such respect for Akio and his hard work, and hopefully uh, appreciating the way that we we handled the music and, and made the film, to give us the permission to uh, allow us to use him, you know, performing their songs. I mean, that is, uh, to my knowledge, unprecedented and it, it's yeah. unbelievable. So, um, yeah, no, that's absolutely awesome, and that's. Uh, sometimes I think like, okay, well, what if they had just said like, oh, this is like very cute, but uh, you know, Not no thanks. Right. Yeah, yeah. would have been a tough, uh, tough to blow four years of your life like that. But uh, you know, it's uh, all worked out, and I do think it's really the the greatest affirmation uh, of his hard work. Right. Well, you mentioned this taking eight years to do. What? Why the long process in it? I mean, I think. From a story standpoint, it worked out good when you started because all the things that Jimmy went through. But yeah. why did it take so long to get this uh, wrapped up? Well, so it's funny. I mean, originally I thought I might film him for about a ye- year, year and a half. I don't know. Documentary, you never know. And then um, I originally thought the ending of the movie would be when he goes to Tokyo with Led Zepp again, because I kind of thought, oh, that might wrap it up in a nice boat. East uh, meets West, uh, some friction. Yeah. Let's work it out. We all love this music together. We make a great show. And after the concert, I was like, hey, Jimmy, I think uh, Akio, I think it all went great. Uh, let's uh, might be a wrap. I don't know. Might be, it was really great. And he said, well, 
I really wasn't happy with uh, this detail and that detail and this <laughs> detail. And I was like, wait, what? And he's like, I think I'm going to leave this band and, and start my own band that will be wow. on a higher level. And I thought, oh, uh, oh boy, either am I in on this ride or out? And I thought, well, things might get hairy and might get interesting. So I'm going to stick with it. I didn't necessarily expect that to go another two or three years, but it did. Right. But then the story got a lot more interesting. You know, you see him struggle with his dream and struggle with uh, trying to deal with the reality of, you know, just building a band. You know, you're 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 not Led Zeppelin, and you have to just book shows like a like a like an upstart band and prove yourself and deal with I don't know booking agents and all this stuff. So um, it it the film got so much deeper, and then the ultimate payoff of having Jason Bonham like call. Right. Um, that that was came really out of the blue and was a uh, lifesaver, probably literally for Akio and was so beautiful. The payoff, you know, that was year four of filming. So that was we were invest all invested. I mean, our small crew, like when he got that and we were down there in Australia and we're on this little boat and he's talking about how his father could never take a plane. He never left Japan. And wow, now I'm in Australia. I'm playing this music. I'm playing with the Jason Bond. I'm like, we all cried. Like it was a pretty, pretty sad little scene, but we were just so happy for him because no one had ever worked for anything more than that. Anyway. So then the film premiered at South by Southwest. And then uh, there was COVID and yeah. it was like a whole thing. And then it just took a long time to, in addition to the Led Zeppelin music, there's Johnny Hooker, there's Muddy Waters. There's a song by Dmitry Shostakovich that for whatever reason, the rights holder on that wanted to be paid four times what Led Zeppelin was getting. <laughs> that like took a year just to get that one song. So um, uh, for, for good reason, because I have ultimate respect for the artist. Right. Music rights are very complicated, and I'm a very, I'm like a one man band with a very patient music supervisor, and I just didn't want to contra contra compromise any of the music. So to get it all sorted and all legal and all cleared for uh, whatever we call this commercial release and theatrical release, it just took time. It just took time. But now, after eight years, I'm really proud of a movie that. Um, uh, I told the story I want to tell, the way I want to tell it at a high yeah. level. And in addition to these amazing compositions by Led Zeppelin, you know, you've got Muddy Waters, Helen Wolf, Otis Rush, Elvis Presley, The Miracles, um, Shostakovich. Uh, I mean, it just, it's packed with really right. high level music. Link Ray. I mean, um, probably for good reason. If this was produced by some company, they never would like have this much great I peep into it right like it yeah, that so, means I mean, a lot though the music yeah i mean uh good thing i don't have any kids because their college fund is <laughs> uh, yeah but it's all worth it what do you want the audience to take away from this movie who are you who is this movie geared to and what do you want them to take away from it for me this this movie is for the music lovers and for led zeppelin lovers and blues lovers and i think it's um I going into it, you know, hey, I have 300 bootlegs and this and that. Right. I, I thought I knew like uh, Jimmy Page inside and out. I was constantly like uh, stunned at, oh man, wow, I didn't realize he was on a high lot here. And wow, listen to the tone of the evolution from 69 to 70. And, uh, you know, like it's it's just, I don't know, peeling the oven, might, peel, peeling the onion might be a cheesy, uh, but right. just revealing the layers and also i really wanted to make i i hate music documentaries that talk about oh man this music is great this record is great like wow there was nothing like it i just want you to fucking be immersed in it and feel it and just yeah. you're gonna please go see it in a theater with a great 5-1 setup so that when we reach that climax at the whiskey and he's doing the epic live how many more times solo right you it just washes over you and you can really uh catch the vibe of how powerful this this music is um so yeah i just want people to be taken with the power of the music and to really appreciate craft yeah and i think that's the craft of the plane that's the craft of of mr page's original uh compositions the, the craft of his uh, brilliance and laying it down in the studio, 
the stage magic of performing it live, and Akio, and now his army of Japanese craftsmen and women, just to try to get capture fifty percent of that, like right. uh, all of that. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, that was one of my biggest takeaways from the movie. That, as I mentioned, when I first the first 15, 20 minutes, I'm like, okay, I see what direction it is. Cause yeah, it's definitely about the music, but there's so much more involved in seeing all these people that work with him, the seamstress and <laughs> seeing her like the way he's just changed. Like, Oh, I don't want this green around the, the leaf. I want it to be a silver. And she just has this look like, okay, <laughs> like I'll do. Yeah. And just, and the close-ups of the, the outfits are just beautiful. I mean, I've like, I've seen other tribute bands and they do have them and, no. Some are better than others, but that, when you look at up close, it really is mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I, again, it's like what, what's, this is what separates him from, you know, he's in his own class. I don't right. know. I think he's, he started referring to his band as a revival band, not a tribute band. And I think that's nice because tribute band, I think just at this point has this kind of cheesy connotation, but you know, it's like, um, in all seriousness, I think, what, what do we call Yo-Yo Ma? Uh, you know, someone who is, is dedicating uh, themselves to performing the work of the masters. And I think that Akio is doing that, only he's also uh, taking on trying to recreate some of the stage magic. Because, uh, you know, unlike Bach, we do have, you know, great uh, movie footage of Jimmy Page <laughs> yes. doing his thing. And that's part of it. And um it's for I think for an audience when when uh, Akio is doing his thing live, it's, it harkens back to the original and that magic of the the live experience on stage, the danger of the improvisation, and just that singular stage presence that that Jimmy Page uh, yeah. has. I know you have a lot of premieres coming up at the beginning of September. I'm going to be at the one in. I'm probably going to go to the one in San Rafael. So you guys are going to be up there. Oh. Yeah, yeah, we're oh, going to be cool. there for that one. Okay, cool. I'll see you up there. What's next? I mean, where after the premiere comes out, I mean, are yeah. we going to see it on streaming? Is it going to be more a larger theatrical release? What's next? Yeah, so this is all uh, kind of pretty organic. I mean, we're um, putting it out in theaters. If somebody out there, hey, why doesn't it come into my hometown? Please call your <laughs> call your local theater. I need some Mr. Jimmy in my life, and maybe we can book <laughs> it. I, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, we, we play a lot of theaters, we get some great reviews and then, um, wherever movies wind up, if then it winds up on, uh, Netflix, Hulu, uh, whatever it is, iTunes, some kind of DVD, uh, for sure. For now, we're fully focused on like, let's let people rock out in a theater with fellow, uh, a good sound music. Yep. Yeah. And really just experience it in that immersive way. Cause me, when I'm at home watching a movie, I'm cursed by like this thing, like doing right. stuff. And um, I mean, I'm a music nut. I don't even have a five one set up at home. Same. So I think um, go to your local theater, tell them, make sure they have it set at a Dolby 7.0 uh, on the volume, and you should be rocked into oblivion and have a really good time. But yeah, hopefully we we do theaters. I I know they're. Again, it's pretty organic. So they're like adding them maybe every week. So hopefully we have a nice run there. And then it winds up on all the other stuff. And is he playing a show up in San Rafael as well the day before? Did I yeah, he's playing, uh, he's playing at Sweetwater uh, the night before. So if you if you want to make a weekend of it, go see the band. Yeah. Um, right now they're focused on recreating MSG 73. So it'll be awesome. uh, that show. Um, and yeah. he does the full 26 minute. Um, Dazed and Confused, which is wild. Um, and I really think that Jimmy Page singled out like appreciation for that because uh, he, you know, I mean, yeah. to, to think of the time it took to figure out uh, 26, there's so many notes in that. And then uh, the Boeing, I mean, yeah. to all, oh. the, all the facets of pay, to figure out all the Boeing stuff, I mean, it's just wild. Well, I think that was in the movie too, or just on YouTube when he met Jimmy. And yeah. Jim even said, oh, you got all the parts right, or you got everything, or you played the 1970 version. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I no, can you, imagine. He, he, he must have got chills when he heard Jimmy say that, because that must have been an honor to play in front of him. Yeah, I mean, we so we went to that little club, you know. Oh, that, okay. And to recreate, to like revisit. And I was like, I got nervous 
just thinking because the club was in Tokyo and everything's pretty tight quarters. So it was like a 30 or 40 person club. And Paige was sitting, I mean, I don't know, 20 feet from him. I mean, I was like, I feel nervous just thinking about you having to do this in front of him that close. And if you watch the video, like he actually crushes it. And I'm sure there's no way. I'm sure Mr. Page and, and he was there with his friend Ross Halfin. I'm sure when they walked in, it's like, wow, there's four Japanese guys on stage, like wearing you, you and your friend's pants from 1973. Like it's it is kooky. Yeah, why wear? But once he starts playing, and they go into the live arrangements, and the tone is so spot on, and the playing is so lively and great, like you can see Page really getting into it, tapping along, and I think absolutely it was that 26 minute days and infused that that like really topped it off right that's i think that's what every guitarist likes no singing (laughs) just someone just (laughs) jamming for 26 minutes that that's ideal well peter thanks again for joining me um i always like to end my show and by asking a question and get a one word answer from you so let me ask you some questions and you could kind of give me your answer on this um Mm -hmm. favorite led zeppelin album presence Mm, nice a favorite led zeppelin song uh achilles last stand Okay. Jimmy Page or Robert Plant fan? Oh, Jimmy Page. <laughs> no, I love Robert Plant too. No, right. just... um, should they have continued after the O2 show? <laughs> I mean, as a fan, as a fan, obviously I'm going to say yes. I'm dying to see that. Right. However, if it, if it isn't in them, if it, if Robert Plant didn't want to do it or whatever it was, then I, I I go by what you know. If it isn't there, it isn't there. So I'll, I guess I'll say no because they didn't. Okay. Your favorite live bootleg year? I just have a thing for 73. I, I, I love the introduction of No Quarter into the set. I think it just uh, opened up a whole other range of color into the show. Yeah. And I think we're all embedded with the song remains the same watching that so many times. It's it's in our, in our DNA. Uh, the last bootleg you listened to? Copenhagen 79. Vastly mm-hmm. underrated. Yeah. <laughs> what was the first bootleg you listened to? The, the first one I bought was New Orleans 73. I remember that. Um, what's that one called? Something in the Butter Queen. Oh, that. May, sound, May in the Butter Queen? Something, yeah. something funny. The May there. Queen in the... Wait, no, oh, I should know this, but yeah, I, I know the one you're talking about. But uh, yeah, it's a pretty funky uh, soundboard recording. The communication breakdown on there is so funky and yeah. dirty. And I think a precursor of the stuff they laid down the new tracks they laid down for physical uh, graffiti. But um, yeah, no, that's, that was the first one that I bought. Well, and I think that's, what's so dynamic about when they play, you could listen to a bootleg from night to night and it's completely different the way they go into the, you know, drums and, or the way they go into the guitar and Jimmy will approach the solo differently. They just, you know, to quote Dave Lewis and his wonderful uh-huh. magazine type of loose, that's exactly how they play. Yeah. Just however it felt good, they went for it. So, yeah. So. I mean, uh, uh the the danger is something that i think artists um could learn from in general like i think it's like uh you know it should be an, or an organic living thing that the performance can, if if the performance isn't on the edge of going off the the rails or if it isn't exciting to the performer in the moment like what's the point like i just love that I mean, but at the same time, you have to be really good to be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, and I think all four of those, and I, I think that's a great um, analogy too, because that's exactly how they play. There's some nights when they went over, but yeah. those nights when they're all dead on, I mean, it's just, it was magical. What was the last Led Zeppelin song you listened to? Or you heard? What? I, feel like, I feel like I was I was just rocking out to into I've been on the later stuff uh, yeah. lately, so uh, I guess I'm going to say I'm going to crawl. I think was oh, the one. That's a good song. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Peter. Any last words for our listeners? Uh, I just want to say thank you. I know we've been getting a lot of questions online. When's this movie coming out? When's this movie coming out? Trust me. I have been working on it so hard all these years, just trying to make it happen. And uh, if you could come out and buy a movie ticket and rock out, I hope you're entertained. And uh, I'm really grateful for everyone's support, encouragement. Thanks for hanging in there with me. This has just been me, a labor of love, my love for the music, uh, my respect for what Akio's done, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity. So thank you. Okay. Plug the website so they can see times and oh. show times and all that. Gotta have to for- can't forget that. Yeah, please go to uh mrjimmymovie.com and it'll uh it kind of will refresh maybe every week. So look for when it's uh coming to your town. And again, yeah, if your local cinema isn't playing it, call them, tell them I need some Mr. Jimmy in my life. 
<laughs> Very good. Well, thanks, Peter. I look forward to seeing you. I think it's September 10th. You're playing up in San Rafael. So I'll see you then. Cool, man. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks again, Peter, for joining me, sharing your love for Led Zeppelin and bringing this incredible documentary on Mr. Jimmy. And again, that website is mrjimmymovie.com. Go in there. You get signed up on the update list. There's a list of all the um, showtimes coming up as well and what areas. So definitely recommend it. And as he also said, you could go to your local theater and request Mr. Jimmy movie. I want to crank out some Led Zeppelin 3 tonight. How about we do some friends? Have a good one, everyone.